Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking about the experience of losing one's sense of free will. Okay, um, the importance of this show is that, like, it's not really just about knowing that free will is an illusion. I mean, in order to, like, benefit from this knowledge, we have to really apply it to our lives, you know, to our personal lives, societally, um, globally. And, and so, like, what I've been doing over the last, well, years, actually, but much more so over the last year or two, is kind of like trying to systematically um, overcome this conditioning um, related to the illusion of free will. Because, you know, you have to realize that um, our whole society, our whole world is based on this illusion. And so, um, even though, like, for example, in school, in science, like in... Um, basic biology, eighth grade science or whatever, seventh grade, I mean, we're taught that, like, human behavior is a combination of nature and nurture. It's a combination of environment and heredity, you know, which, which obviously has no place for free will, but even though we're, you know, presented with that fact and reality in school, it's not something that's stressed and it's not something that beyond that um, education deals with at all, pretty much, at least... Um, you know, K through 12 and all. Um, okay. Um, now, before I go into this, you know, like, the purpose of the show is um, to disavow the world of this, you know, harmful belief. <clears throat> as I've said before, it's not really so much an illusion as a mistaken conclusion. We, we have thoughts, we have feelings, we have experiences, and the mistake is that we attribute these things, these what we do to ourselves. It's a conclusion. In other words, a thought comes to our mind <clears throat> and we'll say to ourselves, well, that thought that I had was completely up to me and nothing that I'm not in control of took any part in that thought at all, whatever. And we apply this to everything we do and that is the illusion so that um, to the extent we overcome that, um, you know, we create a better world. But basically, the reason why it's an illusion, because, I, you know, it's not, again, just about understanding the importance of, um, of this matter, because it's supremely important. It's the most, it's the sec second most fundamental fact of human, of human experience. The first one is that we exist. You know, the second fact is that we do things. So, so like, all right, before I get into this of, you know, just basically experience of just systematically devoting the time and attention to kind of like purposely losing your sense of, of free will so that you kind of like go through life understanding that everything is, you know, quite surrealistically a movie. Um, everything's predetermined, everything is preordained. And um, so before we, we do that, I just want to go through a couple of just hopefully somewhat brief um, explanations of why free will is impossible, because that really is the, um, the purpose of the show. <coughs> um, all right, let's go. The first one is causality, okay? You have to start with the premise that everything has a cause. There's nothing in the world that happens without a cause. That's axiomatic. Um, way to explain that. Like, consider causality is the process by which change takes place. In other words, there, there could be no change in the universe without causality. And causality is simply, you know, the principle that, that, that everything has a cause, that every cause has an effect. And that's, you know, whatever happens is caused. So, so if you start out with that, um, then you, you apply it, apply it to um, anything we do. If anything we do has a cause, okay, then there's going to be a cause for that cause, and then there's going to be a cause for that cause. And the thing with causality is that um, the causes always happen before the effect, the, before the effects. You can never have, you know, a cause happening after the effect, you know, by definition. Um, so, so what happens is, yeah, anything we do, you know, we, we um, say something, we sing, think something, we feel something, we, you know, Anything that our mind does, that our body does, has to have a cause. And again, if that has to have a cause, and that has a cause, we're going back in time moment by moment. Now, if you follow this chain of cause and effect, it ultimately leads to before we were born, before the planet was created, 
before, um, you know, before, the, um, it goes back presumably to, to the time of the Big Bang, you know, 13.7 billion years ago. But that's the basic principle of causality. Basically that if everything has a cause, that means every one of our decisions must have a cause. If every one of our decisions has a cause, that clearly means that free will must be an illusion. Okay, so that's one way of understanding. The second way may be a bit more intuitive for, for many of us. And that's just the idea that we have an unconscious. We have a part of our mind that we are not aware of in real time. That's why they call it the unconscious. We're not conscious of it. Um, we, we, we understand that we have it. For example, like the unconscious is the, is the part of our mind that, um, that regulates our bodily organs, you know. We don't have to think about like, you know, having our, you know, organs work, our, our blood flow through our veins and stuff, and, you know, our lungs uh, work. You know, we don't have to think about that because the unconscious does that. Now, here's, here's why the unconscious, just the fact that we have an unconscious, also makes free will impossible. Um, whenever we do anything, there has to be a reason, right? There has to be a cause. But think about Think about, um, let's say, a decision. There have to be reasons why we make the decision. When we're, whenever we make a decision, it's based on information, on data, on experiences, on past experiences. It's based on various kinds of considerations that we're going to ultimately consider and then um, reach a conclusion about. So what happens is all this information, all this data, it's way too much to be stored in our conscious mind. Okay, because basically our conscious mind is simply aware of what's happening, of what the unconscious actually makes it aware of. So in other words, our consciousness is simply awareness, awareness of what the unconscious is actually doing. So the idea is if, if you have a part of the human mind, the unconscious, that stores the information upon which any decision we make is going to be made, then the second fact about the unconscious that we have to consider is that it is the only part of our mind that can access that very same information. In other words, if our conscious mind is not even aware of our unconscious, it certainly can't access the information in the unconscious. So what happens, is, um, and this has um, been shown neuro neurologically, through kind of rudimentary um, muscle movement experiments. Uh, Benjamin LeBay, um, neurophysiologist, neurologist, whatever, he, um, he created uh, an experiment that's been replicated and actually um, made much more robust uh, than his. Basically, his experiment and the line experiments that came after him showed that in the laboratory, through functional MRIs and other imaging um, machines, equipment, the researcher can actually tell when a person's making a decision before, they act, before the person's actually aware of that. So, so basically, we, we understand this. We understand that, um, that basically we're deciding stuff not from a part of our mind that we're in, in control of, but from, you know, from, again, the unconscious. All right, so, so basically, so you have both causality and the fact that human beings have an unconscious, both making free will completely impossible. All right, but again, like not just knowing the fact, that fact um, is the first step to, to what needs to be done in this world. Because like, to the, extent that we, to the extent that we maintain this illusion, this myth, this mistaken notion that we have a free will, Anytime anyone, including ourselves, does anything wrong, we're going to resort to blame. We're going to resort to kind of like the need for punishment. How come the clock's not working? <laughs> but uh, see, that's the thing. Like when, with, with a free will perspective, when things don't work, we human beings are responsible, you know, you know for whatever, whatever. But like when we understand, when we understand that free will is an illusion, that, that nothing's really up to us, that everything's a movie, Again, it's a different, um, right now the clock's not working. It's like, all right, now it's working. <laughs> I don't know if it's working right, but anyway. So like, the idea is like, when things happen, under the free will perspective, you know, we, um, we attribute them to ourselves and each other. 
And so when things go wrong, if we have a free will perspective, we're going to attribute to it, it to a person or something, which is completely mistaken, completely delusional, because again, if nobody has free will, nobody's really ultimately responsible for anything. Um, all right. So, so yes, yeah, so the idea is not just to know the fact that our that free will is an illusion, it just can't exist, it's impossible. And just like as an aside, even if like you're kind of like attempting to, um, to sidestep the laws of nature, law of causality, the principle of causality by asserting that our decisions, our thoughts are quote unquote spiritual, you can't escape causality because like even a spiritual, quote unquote a non-physical thought would ha occupy a precise, certain, Define space within the timeline. Okay, in other words, like even if you define a, um, a thought as spiritual, it takes place within a certain moment in time, and that fact is what makes it um, subject to the laws, uh, the physical laws of the universe. Um, Einstein, with his theories of relativity, explained that it's not really time and space, it's actually both space time, it's, it's space time. You know, time couldn't exist without space, matter, whatever. Space couldn't ex exist without time. All right, so um, so let's get let's get to this. All right, so um, all right, it, it kind of is a bit impossible to ignore the fact that um, that free will is an illusion if you work with this. I mean, I've I've worked with this for decades. Uh, I've been doing this show for a bit over a year. I um, have a meetup that I started April. 10th, I believe, 2010 in Manhattan, and, um, you know, I read about this, I write about this, um, this is like the 50, what is, 57th episode, yeah, so actually, yeah, we're, we're into our 60th episode, and I do the show in Manhattan, you know, the myth of free will with, um, with my producer and friend who, who wants to remain anonymous, he, he calls himself the messenger, and for that show, I'm like the Ortega truth machine, so anyway, I do stuff, and you know, regarding this, I think about it. In, in order to explain this to audiences, to, you know, to um, viewers, you know, I have to consider it. I have to know it. I have to go through it in my mind in various ways. So it's like, it's a bit difficult to ignore the fact that our free will is an illusion, that, you know, free will doesn't exist. But um, that's not the same as saying that um, that we're actively working on overcoming it. In other words, like, yeah, it, it's, you, you can't, it's not something that you just know and forget about, okay? To, to the extent that um, we as a people, you know, individuals, society, is going to, are going to benefit from this very, very powerful, very new, very revolutionary knowledge, because nothing like this has ever happened on the planet, you know? We're basically going from a free will consciousness to, the, to a causal will consciousness, and that's kind of like, that's seeing, seeing the world in a completely different way, you know. We're not the authors of anything we do, we're puppets, we're robots, mannequins, whatever you want to call it, you know, life is a movie. It's a profoundly, distinctly, categorically different way of seeing reality. So, so again, so we've got to work on it. Now, the way I've worked on it um, in the past and this works. Um, before I did this show, I was um, between 2003 and 2006, I did a show called The Happiness Show, where basically it was just the idea of presenting the fact that happiness is really our most important goal in life. It's really the, the purpose of all other goals. And as with all knowledge like that, it's not really enough to kind of just know that. You have to know it deeply enough, strongly enough. You have to know it in an integrated way enough to be able to use it. So like when I was working on happiness, uh, and this has like been demonstrated empirically, you can like basically say affirmations to yourself or listen to affirmations, I'm completely happy, I feel great, you know, uh, whatever. And that will both induce feelings of happiness and maintain them. And that's, so I did that and, and it works. I know it works. <laughs> that's why I applied that same kind of um, strategy, the affirmations to this, um, this goal of integrating the knowledge that the free will is an illusion. Um, so, um, so I've, do, I've done that, and, and it does work. 
Um, another way that I do this is that I listen to um, the episodes of my shows, you know, MP3s, just put them into my MP3 player and just like, you know, go over the, 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 um, the concepts, uh, go over the basic facts. And again, like, you know, um, I could pretty, pretty um, accurately say, I don't think anybody knows this, this matter um, more comprehensively than I do. I mean, you've got philosophers that will write, you know, several books on it, but you know, half the time, and they get it, they get the free will's illusion sometimes, most of the time they don't. You know, most, the vast majority of philosophers just, you know, they have a need, they have a need to believe in free will so they can cock these, like, these obfuscative, completely <laughs> sophist arguments that, that, you know, that basically ignore, ignore the principle of causality. They may go on for, like, chapters or an entire book presenting, you know, why they believe we have a free will, without it at all addressing the fundamental um, principle or fact that, that prohibits it, the causality. Um, and you can't say like, you know, sometimes I'll say, well, you know, our, our human thoughts don't have a cause. But like, if, if, if our human thoughts didn't have a cause, then that would render them random. And firstly, randomness doesn't exist in nature. There's apparent randomness. Randomness tends to mean without order, but in a stronger sense it means without cause. And so, like, again, nothing in the universe happens without cause because of what we explained before about, you know, change being the basic process of the universe that, um, that governs everything. And without change, there'd be no causality. Without causality and change, nothing would be happening. All right. Um, so, let's see. Now, um, yeah, so like, so I've been working, I've been working on overcoming this conditioning, because that's what we're doing, you know, we're overcoming condition, and you know, this isn't like new, I mean like, um, I think maybe in World War II and other war, the Korean War or whatever, um, certain kinds of like countries, certain armies would, would, um, would experiment with brainwashing techniques where they would get people to try to like lose their beliefs. Let's say a person really believed in, in the value of democracy, you know, and you know, there was a regime that, that you know, was so totalitarian or something. So the brainwashing would be, go something like, you know, you know, democracy is terrible, whatever, you know, basically reconditioning a person from, you know, the established beliefs. So then that after that, sometimes what they would, um, if these prisoners, whatever, would get um, rescued, then they would have to go through a deprogramming, deconditioning, reconditioning uh, protocol to um, to kind of undo the brainwashing. All right. So, so basically, what we're doing in, in this, we're kind of like in a sense brainwashing ourselves. We're 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 doing what um, what athletes do, what what people who succeed do. Basically, just um, keep focused on on concepts on principles on on thoughts on values that are conducive to to one's goal you know you know whether it's to run faster or to um to do something better you know whatever okay um but yet yeah, it has been a, a real godsend to be able to work on overcoming this because it works uh for example um after i did the happiness show i um I devote a lot of my time to, to try and end global poverty. And um, so I had to get into politics for like four years. And politics is really, really um, debasing the way it, you know, it's conducted now. It's like, it's, it, it robs all of us really of a lot of dignity. I mean, um, politicians, you know, like for example in politics, in the Senate, you can lie all you want. There's no, there's no law against lying in the Senate. <laughs> you know, it's like, but anyway, just the whole competitiveness, the two-party system, pitting, you know, you really have to go, you know, after other, other candidates. And like, a lot of times it's not about the issues, it's about personal matters that may or may not matter. But anyway, um, when, when you work with that kind of competitive perspective as you do in politics, there is a great tendency to kind of like dislike or hate the opposition. You know, um, you, you sometimes hate the opposition's values, you know, like for example, the value that, that it is, 
It is more important, some, some people hold the value, it's more important for a person to earn as much money as they can than it is for people to have enough food to eat and, you know, just have basic um, necessities. To me, that kind of a value is, is evil. You know, it's just evil. Um, so what happens, like, on a political, under the political free will perspective we have now, Basically, if you're going to address a situation like that, you're, not going to, you're certainly not going to feel good about the value, but it's likely that you'll not feel so good about the people holding that value. You know? And that's where this, this overcoming the illusion of free will is very powerfully beneficial. What happens is you may, uh, you may engage the enemy, you know, whatever, um, like, you know, with the Occupy Revolution against the 1%, we may engage the 1% to, to recoup that, that inordinate power and, and wealth that they've accumulated. But to the extent that we understand that they have not been responsible for any of what they've done, that basically they, like we, were all puppets, that everything is pre predetermined, then we do what we have to do. We see those people... Um, as innocent. We, we do what we have to do in a way that's not confrontation or at least not belligerent, not accusatory, not aggressive. I mean, um, any kind of like, I mean, you know, with, with this upcoming revolution, there's going to be some, um, there's going to be, there's going to be a contest. But or, or another way to explain this, like, I remember like learning this a long time ago, like if you're a, um, a martial artist, you know, a boxer, or a, you know, you do um, karate or something. I think it's generally recommended that um, that you kind of like abandon your emotions, that you just stay focused on the task, because like when you get into your emotions, a lot of times that will um, distract you from from what you're doing. So what happens is, to the extent that we get distracted in what we're doing with, with the revolution of 99% and creating a new world that, that actually is sustainable, that you know, we can count on to, to see us through the decades if, if that's um, what we're fated to experience, um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a lot kinder, a lot you know, more compassionate toward everyone. Um, another, another way that I've found, yeah, this just understanding the true nature of human will is very beneficial on a personal level. Is like um, a new cause that I've kind of like decided to just like devote a lot more time to is the way we treat animals, especially farm animals. Um, I personally am a vegan. I, I just won't eat animals because I know how they're treated when they're raised. I mean, basically they're tortured. You have um, female pigs. Um, confined to containers where they can't even turn around for months in a, at a time. You know, um, you have chickens stuffed five to a cage so tightly they can't spread their wings and they live out, you know, pretty much most of their li life that way. It's horrible, so here's the thing. So under the free will perspective, when you think of things like that, you have to conclude that um, human beings are just like God, we couldn't be more evil. Because really, you would, um, if you want to get an idea of what I'm talking about, go to Google, Google video, and um, keyword meet your meat, M-E-E-T, your M-E-A-T. Okay, this is a 12-minute um, video by PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And it's narrated, narrated by Alec Baldwin. And it's just like, it's hard to watch the 12 minutes. They go into how we treat um, cattle, you know, pigs, chickens, um, and other animals, like lab animals and stuff. All right, um, so, so I, the idea is like, fine, okay. With, um, with the free world perspective, we're horrible. We, we couldn't be more horrible. When, when we understand that, um, that we don't have a free will, fine. What we're doing is horrible, but it's not we who are horrible anymore. It's like the universe, you know, who, who is compelling us to do this. Because, again, we wouldn't be torturing those animals if it's something we absolutely had to do, you know, because it's been predetermined, because that's, that's what's been faded. Um, and, um, and so, you know, 
you know, so the, you know, the global poverty and animal <laughs> welfare issues are kind of societal. You know, they're global, or you know, they affect us all on collectively. But um, but another advantage to giving up this insidiously harmful illusion of free will is that your personal relationships um, benefit as a result. Basically, what happens is like, you know, no matter what whoever in your life does um, that you might find wrong, as soon as you remind yourself, as soon as you remember, wait a minute, this person did not do this of their own accord. They're just like, they're as compelled to have done this as, as, as anything else is. Then all the rationale for vindictiveness, for revenge, for um, accusation and all that just vanishes. I mean, you might say to the person, hey, you're doing such and such because maybe the person may just not be aware of it, but you would be doing it kind of like as, a, as an offering of information rather than as an accusation. You know, so, so basically, to the extent that we overcome this illusion of free will, we stop blaming ourselves and each other. And, um, and that, you know, that, that's a very powerful reason to, to take the time that, that it takes to go from just understanding the fact that, hu that um, human will is causal, it's unconscious, it's not free, to go from there to just like integrating that knowledge, really, really knowing it well. Okay. Um, so, all right, so as I've been working on, on um, adopting this new causal will perspective, um, it is surreal. I mean, think about it. First, you have to like, you know, wrap your mind around the fact that everything is predetermined. Everything is a movie. Nothing is up to us. We're just going like, let's say we're like billiard balls on a, on a billiard table. If you, you hit one, it's going to go into another. And none of those billiard balls is, is deciding what they're doing. They're just like moving according to what, you know, what has happened before them, cause and effect. The billiard ball hit, hits them, they, you know. So, um, so, all right, so seeing this new, clearer, accurate perspective of, rea of reality um, has challenges. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm mean, like, you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, what's the point of our... Um, of our lives if we're just like going along for the ride. And I don't know, that's, that's kind of like asking well, what's the point of, of living if we're just alive for like 80 years or so and then there's like an eternity of nothing. Um, and that's incidentally why we like the belief in an afterlife, which I subscribe to and I couldn't at all, I wouldn't begin to try to prove it, it just makes you feel better. So, um, so actually incidentally, this is why some people pretty much cling to this belief of free will because they can't imagine um, life being as, as wonderful without it. To me, to me, I've seen all the harm that this free will delusion causes personally and globally. Every, you know, when people blame each other, people aggress against each other. When people aggress against each other, it creates anxiety, it creates mistrust, it creates conflict. Um, so I've seen, I've seen what, um, what the effects of this illusion. So, um, so when I think about it, you know, yeah, yeah, um, we're all acting out God's will. We're acting out the universal will. You know, we're acting out um, the causal will. You know, basically, we're just um, we're expressing you know, the universal will. Not, we're not deciding it. And, and so it's a surreal kind of like a realization, you know. Um, and, and, you know, even when I think about, when I try to like lose this sense of free will, what I work on most actually is, is, um, is in relation to other people, because that's where it matters the most. You know, just as a concept that everything is predetermined, it's cool. It's cool to reflect on that. But again, you know, the value of overcoming this is in how we treat others and ourselves. All right, we've got about a minute left. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. this is, basically, the basic point behind this show is that it's not enough to just, like, recognize and understand the free will's illusion. 
the value of that knowledge is then incorporating it into your life, integrating it, using it with your family and friends. When people do things that are wrong, that you consider wrong, instead of like, you know, making a snap judgment of their guilt and their blame, understand that they had absolutely no choice but to do what they did. And that'll probably bring to whatever you're considering a new and fresh perspective that'll make, you know, resolving whatever it is much easier. All right. Um, check our show out in Manhattan, Myth of Free Will, 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. Uh, thanks. See you again soon.